Okay, let's get it started. So if you remember, so two new things. So actually, so we now have the seminar at this time, uh, so noon every, uh, every other Thursday. So that's going to be a big change. And because we were actually interacting and we had a conflict with the APAM seminar at 245. So now we can actually accommodate that. Uh, so feel free to bring your food if you want. Um, important announcement. So we are actually a link here this year. So uh, we try to get some events on February 29th. So uh, we'll uh, stay tuned on that. And if you remember, now we have this new setup where we also have some updates from people from the group every other meeting. So today we'll hear from Aziz and then from Kate on their latest developments, first on multi-fidelity and then talking about microphysics. Uh, so happy to hear from your uh, latest results. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, let me know if there's any problem with the sound at any time. So, yeah, in this talk, I'll present holistic multi-fidelity model parameterization scheme that I've been working on with Pierre in collaboration with Liran Fang and Mike from East Irvine. I guess most of you know Mike is also part of LEAP. The motivation behind this work is uh, related mostly to the recent advances in machine learning based parameterizations. And one of the major uh, drawback or uh, challenges posed by machine learning parameterization is their lack of generalization beyond the training data. For instance, the initial training uh, machine learning parameterization, they have been trained on historical data or historical observations. And then when these schemes they are tested on a different climate scenario or case, for example, warmer climate, they most of the time they tend to outperform and give erroneous uh, errors. Another part of the motivation behind this work is actually the wealth of uh, relatively low fidelity data sets, mostly with climate, sim with the simple climate uh, uh, configuration like the aqua planets. And so this uh, offers an abundant low fidelity data that is available that we can train on. And at the same time, we have rare high resolution simulation like LIMSIM, where, where LIP is taking part of, which took part of, actually offers high resolution and multi scale climate simulation, but those are very recent uh, efforts that have been conducted. So at the same time, we have this wealth of low fidelity training data that we could try to come up with a scheme to use them in an efficient way to remedy to the issue of the uh, lack of generalization of the machine learning parameterization schemes. And by uh, bridging these two motivations, we thought about using multi-fidelity schemes, which have been uh, developed uh, for some time now in mostly in engineering applications. And these multi-fidelity schemes, they, they are surrogate models that aggregates data sets uh, or models of different fidelities and different accuracy, but they're modeling pretty much the same system. And so we tried to build multi-fidelity kind of parameterization to try to improve the generalization capabilities of uh, these ML uh, schemes. Uh, third motivation would be to build a probabilistic multi-fidelity multi parameterization scheme so that we we'll provide assertive quantifications along with the prediction for the parameterization output. The particular problem that we're interested in was the uh, atmospheric convection parameterization scheme by using CSM CAM5 and SP CAM5 data. So we have a standard color representation of the atmosphere and we tackled the parameterization of moisture and heat tendencies. The definition of liquidity levels was some sense straightforward with these two climate models, since the SP CAM5 is a super parameterized version of the CAM5 and it includes cloud resolving models instead of. Uh, instead of uh, empirical representation of the subgrid processes. So these two CAM and SP CAM5, they are quite, they are built on the same uh, high resolution, uh, result variables models. However, nearly all the uh, parameterization schemes that are different in terms of uh, microphysics or convection parameterization schemes. The uh, radiation package is the only same package between CAM5 and SP CAM5. And even for the radiation package, actually in the standard configuration, it's run every one of two time steps in CAM5. However, it's run every time step in SP CAM5, but still, CAM5 is a good candidate as low fidelity model compared to the SP CAM5. Uh, here I'm just showing, for example, in the context of multi fidelity, an ideal scenario where we would have a high fidelity training data that spans certain intervals, for example, one dimensional variable. And in an ideal case, we want the low fidelity one, which is shown by the red curve, to actually uh, um, extrapolate beyond the training regime of the high fidelity one and also include uh, some of the scenarios that are relevant for the test cases of interest for the high fidelity one. Uh, in our context, we worked with the SP CAM5 training data by using a historical run, and we are interested in, in a global warmer climate uh, scenario for the testing. So we had different candidates to choose from from the low fidelity data using CAM5. Uh, we, in particular here, and also it's these simulations plus 4K and plus 8K runs, they are kind of standard in the climate science community. Plus 4K and plus 8K simulation, they refer to standard to the same historical runs. However, the, the prescri prescribed Sea surface temperatures they increase either by four degrees or eight degrees 
respectively. And so to choose between them, we had to compare these, the extrapolation performance of this low fidelity data candidates compared to the high fidelity training data that is available. A sample representation of the data distribution for different inputs and outputs. Uh, here in the way, we have the chosen training data of the SPCAM5, and then we compared the two candidates. The CAM5 plus 4K is shown in blue candles, and then the CAM5 plus 8K is shown in pink candles. And you can see clearly that you have a better generalization when using the CAM5 plus 8K simulation. So here, the test data for the affidavit is plus 4K run, but we're not using any information from the test data. We are just comparing the chosen high fidelity training data and the two candidates for the low fidelity one. And the reason why we have, we believe we have a better generalization for the CAM5 plus 8K uh, data sets comes from the increased holding capacity of moisture in the atmosphere at higher temperatures, which is more pronounced for warm climate for plus 8K run compared to the plus 4K one. Uh, with, the, with these uh, chosen data sets, so we have, uh, we consider a run for, we have a model spin up, but then the data that we took at the end to train was uh, spanning three month period for the SPCAM5. And then we have low fidelity data that is cheaper to obtain that we spent for a whole year, resulting in 120 million points. And then all models, they will, they will be tested on a full year of the SPCAM5 testing data. So we are actually not only extrapolating to warmer climate, but also extrapolating to the seasonal cycle of the SPCAM5 data. Uh, and here's the list of standard heat and moisture uh, convection parameterization for the atmosphere, list of the inputs and outputs, and given the dimension of the problem, but also the size, mostly the size of the training data sets. And as I mentioned, since we want a probabilistic parameterization scheme, both standard Markov chain models to, for this problem, at least they're out of the scope. So we opted to use uh, an ensemble method, which is the randomized prior network. I won't have time to delve too much into it, the technicality part of it, but here's the reference for uh, uh, where this method has been proposed. And the nutshell is an ensemble method that has an explicit incorporation of prior and bootstrapping to remedy that to the issue of uncertainty collapse, which was one of the major drawback for initial standard vanilla ensemble methods that were proposed. So the RPM pro gives a, prob a stochastic probabilistic parameterization scheme, but it's not a multi-fidelity one. We had to come up, yeah, and I'm sorry, before that, uh, one other advantage, uh, one some of the advantages of the ensemble method compared to MCMC ones, is that, of course, we have the parallel training option for these ensemble methods. So if we have enough GPU memory available, we can reduce significantly the computational cost, which I was able to do even for this problem. And I was using Ginsberg supercomputer here locally at Columbia. It's, it's a good server, but there is nothing too, too much fancy about it to some extent. Another nice uh, feature of this ensemble method also for the RPN is that if the same problem has been studied before, which is the case here for the atmospheric convection with CAM and SPCAM, and if the hyperparameters have been tuned, there is no need to retune them again from scratch. So we used uh, uh, results from existing work from Griffin Morse, where they tuned the hyperparameters uh, neural network for the for deterministic neural network for the same uh, convection parameterization problem over 250 tries. And then we built an ensemble, an RPN with an ensemble of 128 neural networks. Yeah, for the multi fidelity one, the architecture uh, that we opted for is the following. So we have two blocks uh, in series. The first uh, neural network We'll, be, we'll have the task of learning the low fidelity parameterization. So we just take the uh, parameterization input as an input and predicts the low fidelity one. And then we have a second neural network that will play the role of kind of a correction between the two fidelities of the parameterization output. So as the different fidelity um, data sets they become closer, the easier the task would be for the blue network. And if it's complex, we rely on the fact that neural networks, they are able to learn even to some extent challenging mapping between different data sets. And the training of, of these two blocks is done jointly. So in the last term, we have two parts. The first part is trying is learning and fitting the first neural network directly on the low fidelity data. And then we have a second part of the loss that um, considers the full network with the two networks in series and directly predicts the high fidelity uh, outputs. Uh, we can compare uh, this work with some existing uh, effort conducted um, mostly performed by Professor Betterton uh, group where they mostly used bias correction approach. So the approach that they proposed first was actually tested on improving low resolution model using high resolution data. But here, if, I mean, as I have shown, I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to improve the parameterization of high fidelity data using low, abundant low fidelity one. And the second uh, difference here is that this bias correction imposes that the dimensionality is the same between low and high fidelity output that you are targeting. But while here, by using neural networks, we don't really have any constraint in terms of dimensionality. Like the scheme that we have it's not the case here, but can be applied directly to multi different resolution problem between the different fidelity levels. 
just other some technical features about the multi-fidelity model. First of all, multi-fidelity schemes, we have to ensure that there is an uncertainty propagation that is coherent between the different fidelity levels, which means that if we have a high uncertainty from the low fidelity, which is coming from this red neural network, we have to have a diverse and high, and high uncertainty in the prediction. And this prediction is directly fed to the network of the higher fidelity ones. So there is a natural uncertainty propagation between the different fidelity levels. And another important feature is uh, in order to consider the distribution shift, because we have the historical run of the high fidelity data and then a warm time for the low fidelity one, we, we chose to normalize the data set by using the warm or low fidelity data because it's close in terms of uh, statistics to the test data of interest that we are considering. Finally, I will compare the multi-fidelity models to different models. So first of all, we have one model that is actually coming free to some extent from the multi-fidelity one. If we just stop the prediction at the first part of the network, we already have a low fidelity prediction for the parameterization output. So that's one model that we'll be comparing to. And then we compare to two other models that are at the time we call it single fidelity models, which are exactly high fidelity ones. One is some simply deterministic neural network that was uh, tuned as I mentioned earlier by Griffin Moore's work, and then another one that is an RPN version of it, which is a stochastic uh, version of the deterministic model, but using RPN. Uh, I will delve into the results. Uh, so here we have the R squared and the ME. Now for the R squared, it's coefficient of determination. The notation is a bit confusing. So R squared can be negative, but it's bounded by one, and the closer to one, the better it gets. So here in this plot, I'm restricting just for positive values, and then for the negative ones, I'm writing them here in numbers for those who are interested. With the same color matching the legend. And in the x-axis, we have all the vertical levels. Here I'm showing them in terms of pressure. From the left part is the top of the atmosphere, and the right one is the uh, closest sea surface uh, level. And then also at the same time, I'm showing the ME as another error metric. Uh, too many information from this size, but I will focus only on three uh, maybe key points. So the first one, you can see that only the multi-fidelity one, which is shown with the continuous red curve, is the only model giving positive results. Uh, for all vertical levels compared to the, all the other models. Another interesting feature is if you look closely, uh, if you look at the two levels that are closest to the boundary conditions, one at the closest of the sea surface, and then the other one at the closest to the top of the atmosphere, we can see that the single fidelity models, the deterministic one and single fidelity RPN, they are outperforming the low fidelity model. However, the multi fidelity is improving on, on all of them. And then for the interior levels, we have the opposite effect. Uh, the low fidelity RPN is actually outperforming the high fidelity or the single fidelity ones. And again, the multi fidelity is improving on all of them. So this shows that the multi fidelity is doing what we wanted to do by leveraging both data sets and not only relying on one of the models and overriding the, uh, the other one. And finally, we can also, by cross, you also look at the effect of introducing stochasticity in the parameterization by just comparing single fidelity RPN with the dashed black curve and then the deterministic neural network. And we can see that we have improved results for all levels uh, below 100 HPA, which shows that the RPN is able to resolve stochasticity in terms of the complexion parameterization for these levels. The same conclusions they, uh, so the previous plots, they were for the heat tendency and the same conclusions they pre-trained for the moist one. Uh, we can also look at different distribution of the errors. Uh, first of all, we can focus at levels mostly between 250 and 750 HPA, which are the critical levels for uh, cloud formation and where we, to some extent, care most about the convection parameterization, but we care everywhere, but those are critical levels. Uh, here I'm showing the results for the heat tendency at around 500 HPA. Uh, first of all, we have the uh, error distribution uh, and longitude latitude uh, structure for the single, for the deterministic neural network one, and all negative R squared are mapped to zero. So all the white regions that correspond to regions where the parameterization is off. And the question is how much are we able to resolve the stochasticity by using the single fidelity one? So we can already compare these two results, and you can see that we have uh, some really nice improvement, uh, mostly in the temperate region, by using the single the RPN compared to the deterministic neural network parameterization. However, we still off mostly in the uh, tropical region, but also in the polar ones. And then we can compare the uh, performance in terms of the extrapolation beyond the training data by looking at the multi-fidelity model, and we can again see some more significant improvement in tropical and temperate regions, but also some improvement in the uh, tropical region one. And we know that this region is really the region where, which is the warmest uh, in Earth. So it's the region where we have most of the distribution test points uh, in terms of extrapolation beyond the training data. Uh, finally, we can also look at the, yeah, when you see this, we can think maybe, even though we have already seen the global results of the air previously, but we can think maybe the uh, most of the um, performance of the multi-fidelity, they are coming from the low fidelity one. So we can compare the performance of the low fidelity one and we verify that it's well below in terms of performance is well below the multi-fidelity one. So again, it shows that we really need to aggregate both data sets to improve the, the parameterization performance. 
Uh, can, we can look at other vertical levels, for example, 750 HPA for the heat tendency, and we here we even have some better results, uh, smaller white regions for the tropical part. And again, the same happened with the moisture tendency. We have the same results. We can also switch to this plot where we have uh, latitude, attitude distribution of the air. And again, we, you know, we have this nice uh, blue region here for the uh, tropical region between uh, nearly 800 to 250 HPA, which are picked up for cloud formation. Also have some significant improvement for the upper atmosphere, uh, upper atmosphere for the polar regions, which is significant for the heat tendency. However, and same happened for the moisture tendency in terms of the improvement, but uh, we still have this white region at the top of the atmosphere, which is not that uh, important to some extent because you know that moisture convection is nearly absent for the uh, upper layer of the atmosphere. Uh, I'm running a bit out of time, but I will. I want to talk a bit about the uncertainty quantification results in a nutshell. So what we have, we have these uh, stochastic parameterization schemes, and what I'm showing here in the y-axis is the uncertainty returned by the model. So this quantity is only estimated based on the input, the parameterization. Uh, we don't need any information about the true target data. If I just have an input, I can estimate the uncertainty by the models. And then I'm, um, we are verifying if this uncertainty coherent increases with the actual error of the prediction. And this x-axis shows the error, which is the actual difference between the predicted parameterization output and the true one. And we see, and I'm showing here for the, uh, the first column is for the multi fidelity one, but the second one is for the low fidelity, and then the last one is the single fidelity RPN for different vertical levels. And we can see that we have nice, I mean, more stretched yellow and red regions for the multi fidelity one compared to the other models, even though the two other models are also doing some uh, good job in uh, returning coherent uncertainty quantification. This is mostly due to the use of the RPA, the same uh, backbone surrogate model. Uh, and then we can also verify the same thing for the moisture tendency. And another thing, we can also verify the structure of the air. So the upper uh, plot, the upper plot, they show the MAE, and then the lower one, they show the uncertainty quantification. And these are for individual input test points in space and time. And we can verify that as the structure of the air varies, we see that some of these kind of vortices of the air, we see that the uncertainty quantification also changed and follows them. Yeah. I'm just picking some random, I also have them screen, some screenshots. Yeah, you see that uh, these screenshots are for different time steps, A and B, and you see that the uncertainty follows the structure of the air. Uh, the same happens with the moisture tendency again. Uh, yeah, I think I'm running out of time, I may not be sure, but I will leave this wrap up slides where we had the multi fidelity parameterization problem to improve extrapolation to unseen warmer climates and also have the trustworthy uncertainty quantification. There are some conditions that need to be verified to, improve, to obtain these nice results. And here are some points that we are investigating now as a follow up of this project, mostly towards uh, online testing for the model in collaboration with Jerry Lynn from LIP and also from, with Blanca Bellor from Meteor France. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Questions? Nice part of these. Um, so, the, if I understand the RPM, you input some vector of inputs and then outputs, uh, vector of outputs, but also uh, some measure of uncertainty in each of those outputs, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, we have, yeah, each model is an ensemble of models. Right. So, for the same input, you have an ensemble of predictions. So then when you're propagating from uh, uncertainty from the low fidelity to the high fidelity uh, networks, do you do that just by sampling that ensemble uh, yeah. from the low fidelity? Yes. So, I mean, uh, for the multi-fidelity one, we have 128 of these neural networks with these structures. Each red network has a corresponding blue one. So we have 128 of pairs. You can see them this way. Okay, so uh, okay, so um, then uh, the each blue one from the high fidelity does not sample multiple red. There's there's sort of a one to one. Yeah, one to one. Okay, okay, great. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions online? Maybe if you don't mind checking the chat. No. No more questions. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Really interesting work. I'm wondering um, 
when you are evaluating the um the error do you just randomly draw um uh, specific uh outputs from the rpn or do you use that whole distribution to evaluate the error yeah that's a good question right now i'm only using the mean when i'm computing the r squared or the me that's this feature we thought about in terms of the online implementation. How would we use the online? So we think about investigating investigating both approaches, either taking the mean or actually at each time that your GCM needs in the computational or inside solving the PD, at any time it needs to evaluate uh, the parameterization output, you would randomly pick one. We think that the second approach makes more sense than the online testing because you choose more to some extent the stochasticity that you are targeting. Yeah, but here for the um, R squared MAE, I'm only using the uh, mean. I also have, I don't have the slides here. I also looked at the CRPS, which is stochastic error metric. There are some stochastic error metrics, but when you use those, um, like here, yeah, I compare multi fidelity, low fidelity, and single fidelity RPN. Those metrics, they only apply for stochastic models. And the comparisons, they're still pretty much the same. The CRPS follows a little bit the MAE that I showed you. Marcus, there's a question. Uh, quick question. Um, the online tests are going to be in CESM? I, yeah, that's so, no, well, okay, so that's a good question. Uh, with generally, that's what you're trying, but that's what we're trying here yeah, with this in the CSM, uh, SPCAM. But then with the uh, Blanca from Meteopons, we're actually trying to look at the extrapolation to a different climate. So we are using their local spot of fish from Meteopons. So they are, they, she's already working on that. She's taking this multi-fidelity parameterization and directly plug it in to the other climate models. So that's why we have two collaborations. Yeah, we're trying both. Uh, there's a question online. Uh, maybe you mentioned it already, but I'm just the beginning of the talk. How did you pair LF input to HF output for training? Okay, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so in the training, they're not, uh, yeah, that's also the good side. They're not directly mapped. Uh, so the input for the low fidelity is only mapped to the corresponding uh, low fidelity output. And then for the second part of the training, we take the high fidelity output and implicitly the network throughout the training, since the first network is learned, is learning the low fidelity mapping. It's estimating throughout the training process the corresponding low fidelity output of the given high fidelity input. And then it's also passed to the second network to predict the high fidelity output that is trying to match it. Why we opted for this strategy? Because in this strategy, we don't need, we don't have the requirement of having a one-to-one -one correspondence between low fidelity and high fidelity. You don't need for the same, uh, I don't expect, for the same point, you don't need the corresponding low fidelity uh, output and the same for the exact same input for the high fidelity out one. That's, we think it's kind of a hard constraint to have. And in this case, you can have this thing of low fidelity and high fidelity data sets. So there is no real mapping between low fidelity input to high fidelity output. It's learned implicitly by the network with this learning process. Okay, I don't know if that was clear, Sangdruk in the chat. Yeah, great. I think we can oh, oh yes, I Okay, yeah, I was um, curious what you said about the training and the seasonal cycle part of the mm -hmm. training part of the seasonal cycle. Did, were you basically able to learn the seasonal cycle through this process, or did you see some evidence that you were getting trained on some part of it? Yeah, that's also that's a good question. Uh, so the, there's no clear answer for that. I have some slides showing the temporal variation of the error. I can show you, and you can assess to some extent if we learned it or not. Yeah, uh, so for example, here I'm showing the R square in time. And so here, I mean, this, this testing is all, all, all performed on the warmer climate that is not seen, but at least I'm, I'm sorry, I'm highlighting in red uh, the temporal window that was used for the uh, training of the historic run of SPCAM 5. And you can see that. So in this plot, uh, again, the, uh, the red one is the high fidelity one. And I mean, compared to the other models, it's, complete, it's clearly outperforming them, but you can see also for the MAE, for example, we have the same order of magnitudes for the MAE beyond the temporal window. So it seems that it's extrapolating even beyond. Like the seasonality effect is not affecting much the multi-fidelity one. It's but it's not the same conclusion for the other models. 
the performance of the other models for some levels, it seems that they it's affected by this by the seasonal. So that introduced, like you see, yeah, for example, for these two plots, see how the errors for the black and blue curve, which are the same for the delta one, that is significantly lower in this window compared to beyond it. But for other levels, we see that they have some spikes in the air, and this, even this window region, while it's, I mean, it's also similar to the same magnitude that you have beyond it. So the multi-fidelity seems to be resolving the seasonality. The other ones, they struggle, but not all the time. They also sometimes do, uh, they only even circle even inside, yeah. The, the, the challenge is like, how do, how do, how we do, how we disjoint the both extrapolation we are performing, because they're, again, always performing to warmer climate here for the single fidelity models. So we are doing two, Extrapolation at the same time, seasonality and warm climate. Yeah. Thanks, Aziz. Thank you.